Hey guys, welcome back to the Frank Driscoll Show. We have special guest, the one and only Chantel Ray. Now guys, she has sold over a billion homes with her and her teams. She's probably one of the best CEOs slash real estate agents slash CEOs that I've ever personally worked with and encountered. Um, she is absolutely amazing. We wanted to welcome you out to the show. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. That's a heck of an intro. I don't think I can live up to that, but you were super sweet. <laughs> well, personally, you know, just, just to give you guys a little background, um, I had the, the wonderful experience that she brought me out there uh, to do a little speaking event to, to help out a lot of uh, the different people in the area around Virginia Beach. And let me say, having actually a chance to see her in action and one, how efficient she was, I don't think I've met too many people that were so dialed in uh, multitasking on a schedule. Uh, second thing is of the time that she used, uh, not only was she absolutely efficient, um, she taught me things just by allowing me to watch her that I immediately took home and, and put into action for myself and, and helped me become more successful. And I, I loved also that I could truly care that she commands rooms. Like there's not often people I go into and just everyone is watching, you know, hoping to learn from that person. She's so caring and giving. So it, it's, I'm super, super excited to have you on the show. Thank so, you so much. so kind. <laughs> so first thing, how did you get started in this business? Like what, what kind of led you uh, to real estate in, in particular? Well, I used to be a children's pastor and then I was a youth minister before that. And then I really, honestly, I tried to buy my first home and it was like a disaster. I called three different agents. Two of them never called me back. One called me back two weeks later and I'm like, okay, <laughs> we're going to have to fix this. And so I just decided to get into real estate myself. The first year, um, I was rookie of the year for all of our Hampton Roads. I sold more houses in my first year than anyone else. And um, quickly became a team. I didn't like, I didn't, I don't like driving. So I wasn't even out of training yet. And I hired my first buyer's agent. I was like, I got to hire someone to take out the buyers. Cause I know I'm not going to like that. And so I barely, I barely have worked with buyers at all. Um, I really just loved working with sellers. And then I just got to the point that I, I just wanted to grow other people. So I was like, okay, I've been successful at this and now I want to, I want to leverage my time. And one of the things my mom said to me when I was younger that I've, you know how sometimes people say something to you and it just kind of clicks. So my mom said to me when I was younger, I was at the hair salon and I said to her, I said, mom, I really want to be a hairdresser when I grow up. And she said, uh, 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 she said, I'm going to stop you right there. She's like, if you want, you can be a hairdresser for a little while, but your end goal has to be that you're going to own the salon. She's like, cause think about it when you're 50 years old and you are standing there and you're on your feet all day and blow drying people's hair out, you're getting exhausted. You're 60, you're 70. You, can, you, your physical body isn't going to be able to do it, but your mind, you can own the shop. You can give people advice. And so she really instilled this idea to me that, Hey, don't be the hairdresser own the salon because your mind you can use for a lot longer. I mean, you get to a point where you're like, Oh, I'm, I'm tired of schlepping all over town. Right. Mm -hmm. So she kind of really dialed that in. And so that's kind of, I've never forgotten that 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 analogy is just so good so i just that's where i kind of said you know what i'm gonna own i'm gonna own the salon instead of actually being the hairdresser that's such great advice and and i think it kind of helps when you know the end game in mind you know exactly what you're building towards like i tell your story quite a bit to like people that i coach or work with that immediately you already knew what you didn't like and you were hiring and training I was just trying to get through training and pass the test and things like that. I wasn't even thinking like that next step at all, but you were so far ahead of the game that it's no wonder after you put in the work because you know exactly where you want to go. So it, it's pretty impressive. But well, let me I think it's also ahead. about confidence too. You know, every single day I tell my son, and it's so true. I say, son, if I could handpick every attribute about you, you're everything I've ever wanted in a son. And I tell him that several times a day. And it's constantly like 
the confidence, you know, I have a lot of confidence because my parents told me and my aunt and everyone, they were always like, Chantel, you are amazing. You can do anything that you put your mind to do. And so I'm con you want to be around those kind of people that literally are constantly telling you, you can do anything you put your mind to. And so that's really, really important to me is to be around those people um, who are constantly uplifting you. And you need people to tell you, you need to grow in this area and that's fine. But my number is five to one. You need people who are like five times, they're gonna tell you, you're fantastic. You're doing a great job. Here's how you're excelling. But then they also need that one time where you go, hey, here's an area that we could really grow in. This is an area that we can, you know, kind of take you to the next level. Oh, absolutely. I love that ratio. Um, I, I'm definitely contagious. You know that, you know, I get pumped up. I'm kind of that way too. So I, I totally like to be around positive people, but you also occasionally need that one time where, where you can improve in certain areas. You are absolutely so encouraging. You are one of those people exactly like that. You really know how to lift people up. You know how to encourage them. And one of my favorite lines that I say is that you always stand taller when you have someone on your shoulders. And so, you know, you want to try to prop people up as much as you possibly can and lead other people in that direction. Certainly. Let me ask you this. Who are some of the examples or uh, role models for you that you learned for your leadership? You're an amazing leader. Who are some of the leaders that inspire you? You know, I would say one of them is uh, a guy named Toby who owns Movement Mortgage. Uh, he is an amazing leader and is a friend of our families. Um, another one would be uh, Craig Rochelle, even though I've never met him. I just love his leadership. I listen to his podcast and I would say there's tons of people that inspire me that I've just never met. And you don't need to meet them or actually know them to get inspired by their leadership. And I would say there isn't a day that goes by that I'm not really, really pouring into my leadership. So I wake up in the morning, I just use every single second of my day as a pouring in method as much as I possibly can because life has, you know, I love what John Maxwell says. He says, life is uphill all the way. And it is, and in order for you to get the grit that you need and get the excitement and get the positivity that you need, you've got to be constantly pouring positivity into you by listening to these leadership podcasts. I listen to the John Maxwell leadership podcast all the time, Craig Rochelle, Andy Stanley. Um, these are people I listen to. And then I'm also listening to biblical podcasts all the time. Uh, there's a guy named Lon Solomon Mis Ministries that I love his podcast. So I, you got to find what you absolutely love listening to. We have a leadership podcast that we do. It's called Real Life Leadership. And we just tell real life stories of like nightmares and things that are good that happen all the time. But people learn in stories. And so that's what we try to tell people. Like, here's what really happened. And here's how we handled it. No, perfect. I mean, that's wonderful. You gave such great things. And, and you know, to me, you have so many uh, leadership attributes. What is one thing that you think, besides just confidence, is one of your great leadership strengths that you try to help uh, for people that you're leading? Well, I will say one of the things that I've gotten really good at, but I wasn't good at before, is, and I'm going to write a book, and this is the name of it. It's going to be called, What Does Winning Look Like? Don't you love that title? Yes, that is great. What I'm writing it down right now. Like? That's going to be my next title of my book. And, and here's the thing. I would say step one, every person on your team needs to know what winning looks like, right? Because in their mind, they might be going, oh yeah, this is a great direction, I'm moving here. In your mind, you're like, what in the world? That's not what you should be doing at all. This is what it is. And so you've gotta make sure that the goals are very realistic. So let me give you an example. If you had somebody that was, let's say ISA, that they were setting appointments, you would need to say, 
hey, what winning looks like is you're gonna set either seven appointments every day or three appointments every day, whatever is realistic. And you need to make sure that the, the goals are realistic. Like you need some, you need to get your top performer and go, like if you said, you gotta set 20 appointments a day, well, that's just not even realistic probably, right? Like that's a hard goal. And you've got to say, okay, this is what winning looks like. A, B, C, D, as clearly, clearly defined as possible. And then you've got to be able to hold people accountable to those things. And, and honestly, a lot of time, the place that I see leadership go wrong is number one is they never even define what winning looks like in the beginning. But then they don't have it very specific, measurable, and actionable. And then the last piece is they're not holding them accountable. And you have to be able to willing to like, you know, I can smile at people and I can be like, hey, this is great. But and you can lift them up. But it also at the same time, if week after week you're not hitting your goals, you have to be able to say, Unfortunately, I love you and I'd love to be able to, you know, catch a drink with you or have an appetizer with you. But honestly, I don't know that this is the right fit because you're not able to hit. We've made it very clear of what winning looks like. And we've told you the specific actionable steps to doing it. Like you've got to make a hundred calls per day. Let's pretend that's what it was. Now, if every day you're making excuses, because people will make excuses every chance you get, oh, I didn't have time to do that, or da da da. Well, we already know 100 calls per day or 100 calls per week, whatever it is, is a very realistic goal. You're making choices of choosing to put your time in other areas, but this little target, this is what winning looks like. And you can't be afraid to tell people, Hey, unfortunately, this isn't the place for you. Have you seen the mon the movie Moneyball? Yes. Have you seen that movie? Mm -hmm. Do you know where he talks about where he is like trying to like fire somebody and he's like trying to figure out how to do it? And he's basically like, he says, all right, you just basically go to them and say, hey, listen, I'm cutting you from the team. And the guy says, what? Like, that's so harsh. And he's like, would you rather get one bullet to the head or would you rather get hit five times and bleed to death all over, right? Like sometimes you just have to go, listen, you know, I, I don't want to fire somebody, but you know, when you're firing someone, you do want to go, Hey, we didn't hit the goal. We didn't hit the goal. We didn't hit the goal. Here's, here's a pip, which is a performance improvement plan of what you need to do to get there. And then after one time, after two time, after three times, Hey, it's time to rip that bandaid off. Unfortunately, it's time for us to let you fly and move to another place. And what happens is, is people who are not strong leaders will make every excuse under the sun and say, you know what? Oh, I'll keep him because he's my friend or, you know, all these other things. No, I, I think you're spot on. Having been in those positions myself, um, I think when you first start, it's exactly true. You try, you try to carry them, you're helping, but do you realize they have to want it? And if you clearly spell out exactly what the expectations are with that plan, that A, B, C, D, to do it, and then that, that PIF where you're following up and you're giving them every opportunity, you know what? At some point, either they don't want it or it's not the right fit, and you're actually doing a disservice by keeping them there because people want to be successful also, or at least be in the right position. So I think at some point, yeah. it's what about the hiring? What about people that have, let's say they, they've got a brokerage right now or they're building up their teams. What are some of the things that, that you seek out or some of your best practices for finding that right talent or in, uh, attracting them to you or your organizations? So for us, you know, we really use the Discord. And if you go to ChantelRay.com slash careers, you'll see a free online Discord that you can use. But we believe that every every position has a discord that that's the right fit like for example if you're an admin you should be an sc or a cs if you want to be a great salesperson you want to be an id or a you know di for the most part as one of your higher ones we've rarely ever seen somebody who's a, a salesperson 
who's an, a CS. If their personality is a CS, where they're extremely detailed and they like to do the same thing every day, you know, they're not going to be successful. So you've got to really know that personality and, you know, know yourself and know, you know, can you do this? And, you know, you've got to be able to set goals for people and you want to find people who want to win. Like my son, what I love about him so much is he literally wants to win at everything. Like he's so competitive, but that's the person you want. Like you want people who want to set goals and that can achieve them. My favorite analogy that I give people about setting goals that are really important is I had a tennis coach one time. I love to play tennis. And I, I asked him, I said, how's your daughter doing? And he is like, um, she's not doing that good. I said, why? I'm like, she's, she's your daughter. Like you should have an, a girl who's like killing it. This was, this was a year ago. Now she's doing great. I and he said, well, he said, I screwed up because what I did was let's say she was at a 4.0 level. He's like, I put her in with the 4.5s. And then what happened was as soon as the four, she kept losing and losing and losing. So then I put her back into the 4.0 level. And what happened there was herself, even though she should have been winning at 4.0, her self-esteem was so bad because she, she was losing everything at 4.5. So even when we put her at 4.0 and she should have been winning, she was losing every game. Mm. And so he said that the goal is you should be winning two out of every three games if you know that you're in the right tennis category. Because if you're only losing one, out, you're only making one out of three, then your self-esteem is kind of bad. And now it sometimes makes you worse. If you're winning three out of every three games, like you're not challenging yourself at all. This is like no fun. Like you're just winning all the time. Like that's, you're, you're not challenging yourself. And so what we say is you need to find people who can set goals and they're winning two out of three times. And you've got to have them have the drive to be able to do it and have the knowledge to be able to stretch themselves and set goals that they can achieve, but they're really pushing themselves. Totally agree. And I think as you do that, you start to build up the confidence like that you have over time and you start to feel you can accomplish anything goals that you can't even imagine setting at the beginning right after you after you stretch yourself and, and grown and got the strength now you're setting goals that you would have never put before and you're starting to accomplish those i mean that's awesome let me yeah, ask you this you, question you just made a good point because what you just said is if you've been on a losing streak right if you've been on a losing streak and you're like, man, I'm in the dumps, like I'm just in a rut, then you right now should just set goals that you, for a couple weeks, you need to be going in that lower category and just making goals that you know for the next few, few weeks, I'm hitting three out of three, three out of three, three out of three. I'm building up my self-esteem, pumping myself up, and then I can kind of pull it back and go to the two out of three. So that's very good. Yeah, I mm -hmm. like that. That's great. Let me ask you this, you know, like successful people have routines. What was, what does your daily routine look at for the people that I, I kind of know, but I'd like just for you to go through like your morning rituals because we've had conversations early in the morning and you're always grinding it out. And it's, I feel like you have that down. So could you just go through and tell the audience kind of what your day yeah. look, looks like? I usually wake up around four or four thirty in the morning. I'm usually at the gym by five at the latest. I'm at there by five thirty. I'm done around, uh, you know, around six a.m. I'm usually six to six thirty. I'm done with the gym. I get home, um, and then I just usually use that that first hour to listen to. I well, my first thirty minutes, I'm spending time with God either reading the Bible or listening to a sermon. Um, and while I'm in the, going to the gym and when I'm coming home from the gym, I'm either listening to a sermon online or a leadership podcast online. And then when I get home, I don't love to read, so I have to force myself to read. So I try to spend about 20 minutes a day. Now, when I say I don't read, it doesn't mean that I'm not listening to an audio book or listening to a podcast. I love doing that but I don't love to read, read, but I still force myself to do about 20 minutes of reading an actual physical book in the morning as well. And then I spend 
a lot of time um, just listening to podcasts and, and kind of uh, pouring into myself for the first few hours. Then I kind of am spending time with my son and getting him off to school. And then um, I usually will spend a couple hours in the morning writing my book. So writing books is really important to me because I feel like God's given me tons of kind of wisdom on things that I've just learned the hard way. And so I would love to save people some of that heartache that I've learned. And so I try to write it down and I actually transcribe it and I have someone that writes it for me. So I actually don't write myself. I just talk and they transcribe it for me. Um, so I spend that time. And then after that, I usually get into the office and I'm basically meeting with my leaders because one of the things I say to myself every day is I develop leaders. It's not something I do. It's who I am. And so spending time with those leaders of the different departments saying, hey, what do we need to do next? How do we grow ourselves? How do we take our company to the next level? And that's the other thing is like, I'm never happy with where we're at. I'm always like, how do we grow? How do we get better? How do we take it to the next level? And that's really important because if you're just, if you're just like, oh, I'll just we're just stay where we are, you want people around you who are like, let's get better, let's grow. I just want to grow and take it to the next level every day. Oh, look, that is such an awesome routine. I, mean, I, I was able to see an action, so I, you know, I, I've seen it, but I just wanted you to be able to share it. I, and I think that consistency of you doing it and then dialing it in, and then and then kind of putting that confidence, being a great leader, you know, for your managers and your leadership, and helping them achieve those next results is extremely powerful to help them grow and take us another level. And there's a lot of people out there that it's hard for them to trust people. They think they have to do everything on their own and everything for every, every possible thing. And it's much harder to grow, right? If you can never trust the people that you're hiring or to help them become great leaders as well, it's hard to grow your company. Um, I would say this too, you know, I have a lot of people watching that wanted me to ask you this question. You know, let's say, what would be, in your opinion, your best advice? They want to become you. Okay, I'll just, I'll just say it honestly. So many people are so in awe and admiring what you've accomplished, and they're there. What advice would you be to give to them that really want to grow? I and mean, we've, we've gone over a lot of things that I think are important, but what would be the single uh, biggest advice that you could share to how someone, for where they are now, they're an agent or, or they're growing out their team, to become what you've accomplished or to do that? What do you think is the most important thing? Well, I would say that the biggest thing is delegation and giving up control. Because what happens is people are like, oh, I gave it to so-and-so to do and he didn't do it as good as I did. And my philosophy is, if I give it to you and you can do it 80% as good as I can do it, then I need to give that task to you to do. And honestly, you have to think about the fact that like, sometimes it's arrogance that can kind of hold you back because you in your mind are thinking, I can do it so much better than so-and-so can. And I think that when you start to get humble and you go, you know what? There are other people that can actually do this better than me. Um, and even if they can only do it 80% as good as you, then still you should delegate that task. And the first place that I had to delegate, because for me personally, especially being a mom and, you know, I have two kids. And so I don't like, I don't do laundry. I don't clean the house. I don't cook our meals. Like I make the most amazing organic uh, things for our family. And I might do a little bit of cooking, but like, I don't do any of the prepping, you know what I mean? So like, I don't chop the onions and do all that. I just come home and I'm kind of Rachel Ray, you know, I'm like, <laughs> and then proof it looks good. But the hard part is like all the chopping and prepping and, you know, and when you're eating healthy. So I've, what I did was I created a checklist of every single thing and checklists are king. You know, because when you're giving that task to someone else, you have to take the time to go, okay, what needs to be done? And then they literally are checking off every little thing that they're doing. And that's how you delegate things is you go, okay, I'm going to let you do it. I might oversee it a little bit. And then once I know you've got it, now I can kind of let it go. And that's the art of delegation is one. 
And I think that there's a book out there. I've never read it, but I saw it at the airport one time. And it's called The Subtle Art of Giving A, and I'm not going to say the words because I don't curse. But I think you have to have a little bit of that. And I've never read the book, so I don't even know what it says. But just from the title, you can figure out what it's saying, right, in the book. But you, you can't be constantly worried about what everyone's saying about you. And, you know, I truly list, I try to live my life for an audience of one, and that's God. And if I know that I'm pleasing him and that I'm trying as hard as I can every day to please him and honoring him, the Bible says, those who honor me, I will honor. And, um, you know, someone asked me one time, they said, let me ask you, do you feel like you're using God to get business? And I responded, I said, I surely hope not. I said, I hope God is using me. And that's truly it. It's like, I hope that God is proud of what I'm doing and he's using me um, in a powerful way because it's for me, it's not about real estate. It's about people getting to a place where they're truly in a personal relationship with God and um, growing their faith every single day. And so that's why it's important to me to write my books and stuff like that. But it's just, it's more than just business for me. It's really about changing people's lives. I mean, look, you're so inspiring. It's awesome. I know you're passionate and I know you're definitely a believe and, 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 I, and I believe you are an instrument that, that God is using. I've seen how much you've donated your time, money, and effort in doing that. What about people that want to reach out, that want to work with you, uh, that would love to come in and learn for you? What would be the best place for them to go to find out more information about becoming an agent or doing the other things that you're doing or any of the other endeavors you're in? Yeah, so um, if you want to learn more about leadership, you can see our podcast called Real Life Leadership Pod. It's called the Real Life Leadership Podcast. You can find that on iTunes or Google it. Um, if you're interested in real estate, um, we're opening up uh, different offices everywhere. Um, we've got a total of seven locations now um, and in across three states. So um, that's at ChantelRay.com. And if you're interested in learning how I lost weight, you would go to ChantelRayWay.com. And I wrote a book uh, about how I lost 40 pounds and was able to keep it off. That's, that's so awesome. And we'll put the links below, um, you know what, and, and make sure that we have those all there. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Is there anything else that you would like to add or say uh, to the audience? No, just that I really appreciate you and you doing this podcast for everyone and just being an encouragement and all the things that you do to really lift people up and encourage them and teach them how to close. Well, I get, I get infinitely more back from the, the people that give to me than I give to them, but I really appreciate it. And thanks so much, guys. Please like and subscribe and share. Sean Torres is an amazing person, so trust me when I tell you, go to those things, follow it. It is very inspirational and you can learn so much. Thank you so much, Chantel, for having it. You have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye.